this is chapter 11, solutions. You've done, already done most of this. All matter can be divided into mixtures and pure substances. Don't get this wrong on the AP exam. Like a, we had a question, I believe it was in this, this class, about peroxide solution, trying to find the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide in solution. It was a test on gases. Some of you missed the fact that the solution is a mixture, a mixture of water and hydrogen peroxide. You don't want to miss those really fundamental ideas. So a pure substance is only that stuff, pure H2O, pure distilled H2O, or a mixture. It could be a mixture that looks like it's uniform, homogeneous. Tap water is a good example versus heterogeneous, real easy to spot, raisins and peanuts, dirt, sand, all of those kind of things. Um, but under that is a category called suspensions. It's just a finer definition of that. Suspension literally means the particles are held above and then they sink out. So dirty water, when you just let it sit, the mud settles out. That's a suspension. Homogeneous are a little hard to tell from pure substances when you look at them. If you look at distilled water and you look at tap water, you're not going to be able to see the difference. You're going to have to know that one is tap and one is distilled. And then we call <coughs> homogeneous solutions, uh, sorry, homogeneous mixtures solutions. But there's a little subcategory when the particles are bigger, and that's called a colloid. It looks homogeneous, but the particles are big enough to scatter light. So this is one of those one little tiny memorized things you have to know. So if you have light shining through a solution, a homogeneous solution, and you can see scattering. So if you've ever driven in a car through fog, has anyone had that experience? Unlikely in Singapore, but once in a while you see fog around McRitchie Reservoir when it's cold enough. The headlights, if you're driving at night, the headlights glance off the fog particles. That's called scattering. That only happens when the particles are big enough to impact the light and reflect back to you. Those are called colloids. So they're small enough to be always suspended throughout the water. They don't fall down like suspensions do but they're large enough to scatter light. This is the only ones that scatter light, and that word is called the Tyndall effect, named after somebody. So these are colloids, and those are the intermediate sized part, um, particles, and it just scatters light. It just means that light is scattered on the particles. Fog is a good example. And then this is the other part that's easy that you've already done. Solutions made up of solvent and solute. Let's just go with this definition. Solvent, oops, sorry, solute is the smaller fraction. Solvent is the larger fraction. So right now we're breathing a gaseous mixture. It's a solution. Can you see any differences in the particles in the air? So it's a homogeneous mixture. What's the major fraction? Nitrogen is 70% of our room air. So the solvent in room air is uh, nitrogen. What's a solute? Every other gas that's in the air, including water. So this is uh, different types of solutions that are way gone from memorizing stuff, but just as a good thing to know, major fraction, minor fraction. So if you have the minor fraction is a gas in a gas, well, oxygen and nitrogen, but a gas in a liquid could be CO2 and water, like a soft drink. Uh, the other way, liquid water dissolved into air. That's a liquid, is the minor fraction. Liquid in liquid could be like ethanol in water. Liquid in a sol solid, this is the only one that you would probably know, dental amalgam, which is what they fill cavities with when it looks like silver metal. Uh, a solid in a liquid would, would be something you know or familiar with, sugar or salt water. Solid solids, once in a while there's a question about an alloy. It's a mixture. When you take, um, for example, copper, and you put a little covering of zinc, copper is what color? Copper. Copper penny, what color are they? Yeah, reddish brown, orangey brown. And then zinc is a silver color. So when you just coat it, it still looks silver. But then when you heat it up, it kind of goes like that. And your eye perceives the color as gold. It looks like gold. That's the alloy known as brass. So brass is kind of a gold color. And it's just a mixture. All you have to do is heat it up, and they come apart because they have two different melting points. Mm -hmm. When you say H2O in air, mm -hmm. is it still liquid, or are you talking about It's liquid, yeah. Water drop humidity is little tiny droplets of water suspended in the air. It's not vapor. Well, it's in the vapor state because it's really tiny. Uh, molarity, we've already done this. Moles per liter. 
molality, whoops, sorry, molality taken off of the AP. So we can skip that, but if you're a senior, you are expected to know it in university. It's just mole per kilogram. And it's abbreviated little m, but I mean, how can you differentiate big M from little m? So a lot of people just call, go M-O-L-A-L, molal. And then mole fraction, we've already covered, whoops, sorry, mole fraction we've already covered in gases, moles of solute over total moles. Remember N of a gas over N total, that's represented as chi. So we've already done a lot of this. That first part you probably did in like middle school. Concentration, well, we already said moles of solute per liter, easy to do. Molality, we can skip. Mole fraction, you already know. Moles over, moles of a gas over total moles. Okay, uh, mass percent has been removed from the AP. I noticed on the quiz though, Adrian put one in, I gotta delete that for you. Uh, this is what you do need to know. Okay, so we don't need to know molal and colligative properties, mass percent. Now you have to pay attention again. Uh, energetics of sol solution formation. Let's say you have a solute like sugar crystals, or let's go with sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, ionic compound. You put it in water, it dissolves. You all have that experience. But this is the step-by-step -step process of what happens. Well, the first thing you have to do is break apart all of the ions, or if it's sugar water, or sugar in water, you have to break apart all of the sugar molecules. Is that endo or exo to pull things apart? Endo, I mean, sugar crystals stay together as crystals when you leave them on the counter, and same with sodium chloride. You've got to actively pull them apart. So this is an endothermic process, <coughs> not a chemical change, just a process. But water is doing the same thing. Where's my magnets? Water is like this, right? It's polar, so the first thing you have to do is break apart the solvent. Also endo. But look what happens when you mush it all together in a big matrix. That is either endo or exo. But there's something else here that happened that we haven't yet talked about, but you might be able to see from the picture. There's a change from these to this. Yeah, you know, what about the uniformity? Yes. There's a word for it, though, in chemistry and physics. What about this? What kind of uniformity is this? It's a lattice. It's quite uniform, quite ordered. What about this? No, no uniformity. So that word to describe that? Entropy. So there's a gain in entropy or a gain in chaos, and that's what's actually driving the dissolving in many cases. So there is another term coming. We don't cover it till the end of the semester, and you'll go, oh, yeah, that's why sugar dissolves in water. So we've got delta H is positive, delta H is positive, delta H could be negative or positive, and we've also got an increase in entropy. That's what's driving the dissolving. So all you have to do is add it all up, and here's a new delta H instead of RxN reaction. It's called delta H of the solution. It's the same concept, though. When you put sugar in water, you can measure the temperature change or sodium chloride in water, you can measure the temperature change, you can calculate delta H of the solution. So SOLN is referring to, to the dissolving, not a chemical change, just a physical process. So for most of them, you've got to put energy in, but you also get this payoff in entropy, which is driving it. And when it's, when it's less, when delta H is less, then obviously it's exothermic. When it's equal, then we're delta H is zero. That's pretty self-evident. This helps you explain why polar and nonpolar solvents don't dissolve. So if you have a nonpolar solvent, like or solute, sorry, like an organic compound, like oil, vegetable oil, and you're mixing it in water, well, we already know they don't mix. But now we see why. Well, remember, nonpolar substances only have LDFs. They don't have polarity or hydrogen bonding. So there's only a small, it doesn't take much energy to break them apart. They're, they're nonpolar. They're moving around really quickly. But uh, water, especially having the hydrogen bond ability, takes a lot of energy to pull apart. So it's a large delta H to pull it apart. And then you only get a small payoff. So the net overall is it's not enough of an exothermic reaction to drive that reaction forward, and it doesn't happen. And so we say oil and water don't mix. So, so far, we've just said oil and water don't mix because one's polar and one's nonpolar. But now we see there's actually energetics behind that. 
that phrase, um, like dissolves like. And now let's do it with a polar or ionic solute like sodium chloride. It takes a lot of energy to break an ionic compound apart because it's got ionic interactions. And we already said water, because of the hydrogen bonding ability, it takes a lot of energy to pull that apart. But because you have hydrogen bonding available or a dipole interaction, ionics, uh, remember when you dissolve sodium chloride, they can, each ion can be surrounded by the water molecules in two different orientations. You get a large payoff. And if that's the case, then you get a negative overall uh, delta H of the solution and it's favorable, so it does mix. So salt and water will mix together, table salt and water. So there's more going on. This kind of a discussion, maybe not so good. This one with the picture, very good. So a particle diagram as an answer would be a really good explanation of this, including the delta H's with a little explanation that because of the attractive forces of the solute and the solvent, you have to put energy in to break them apart. So here is our actual enthalpy of the solution. You've got to take solid sodium chloride, and we're actually going to turn it to a gas here. That requires that much energy. So this is gaseous ions. And liquid water, you have to pull it apart. And those gaseous ions, now we have dissolved ions. That is called the enthalpy of hydration, and we give it another suffix or um, subscript here delta age of the hydration. You just add those together. Is that exo or endo? Exo. So it's more likely to happen. You just add it all up. Oh, sorry. This was just this one step. Now you add it all up, and it's positive. So that means you have to put energy in. But we already know why salt dissolves in water. What's the answer? If you have to put energy in, it won't happen on its own. You've got to put energy in. So why does salt dissolve in water when you don't add energy? Do we have to go back seven slides to show you? What was the other payoff you got? OK, let's do this again. We all, all know salt dissolves in water at room temperature. You don't have to heat it up. And yet, according to this analysis, you've got to add energy to get it to dissolve. So something else is giving the push to make that happen. And what is it? No, you're not stirring it. What was the other payoff? Entropy. Entropy. So if we just add <coughs> this other factor in, the reaction is spontaneous. We use the word spontaneous. So now we know there's two parts to spontaneity. There's the payoff in entropy, delta H, and the payoff in entropy, delta S. So later on, we'll bring those two concepts together a little more later on in the year. That's what's driving the dissolving of water and sugar in wa um, water and sugar and table salt in water. Or you can just say like dissolves like. Better though is too many words, similar in molecular forces of attraction, dissolve similar ions, too many. So we always say like dissolves like. Is that it? Uh, okay, here's some just some cool drugs. This is retinol, vitamin A. Polar or nonpolar. Remember, all these are C, 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 and if there's nothing here, it means there's two H's. When there's a double bond, it's two lines. Polar or nonpolar? Mostly what? Pardon? Mostly what? CH. What's the difference in electronegativity and CH? Say again, louder. I can't hear you. Minimal. Minimal. A very tiny change in, in uh, electronegativity. So is this part polar or nonpolar? entirely all nonpolar. It's all CH. We get to here, there's one little OH. Yes, it's capable of hydrogen bonding, but one little tiny part of the whole molecule. Vitamin A is fat soluble. It doesn't dissolve in water very well. So that means you can overdose on vitamin A if you take too much of it. Vitamin C, polar or nonpolar? Come on, you guys, wake up. Polar or nonpolar? Polar, 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 polar. It, vitamin C is water soluble. Very hard to overdose on. So you can, you have, but then the other pro problem is it doesn't dissolve in your fat tissues and you don't store it. You excrete it in urine if you take in too much. So this is the source of a nickname for old British sailors. They had to bring fruit along with them as a source of vitamin C or they got scurvy. You know what the fruit was? 
limes and lemons, and they were referred to as limeys because of it. It's because this does not dissolve in fat. It dissolves in water. So you excrete it in blood. You know, that's excreted, filtered blood is urine. So you have to constantly replenish your vitamin C. This is absorbed in your fat tissues because of this great big nonpolar tail. So you store it. You don't have to just keep eating it. And if you do, you could overdose. So it depends on the solubility. Vitamin E, soluble or not in fat? Yeah, we got one OH and one O. The rest of it, all nonpolar. So again, you can eat this and you can overdose on it if you take just pills of it. It doesn't get excreted in urine. It's dissolved. It's stored in your fat tissue. This is aspartame. It's what's in um, NutraSweet. And if you've ever tried to stir those little equal packets into water, you really have to stir to get it to go in. Well, this is polar, and that has some polarity. And these do, but this is all carbon. It's a big phenyl group. So there's big chunks of it that, oh, and there's a nitrogen, so that's polar. There's big chunks of it that are nonpolar, but there's some parts that are polar. So it doesn't go into solution as well as sugar, but it's not as bad as something that's all fat soluble. This is what's called magic mushrooms. Have you heard of this drug? They're mushrooms that have a hallucinogenic effect. The compound is called psilocybin. Polar or nonpolar? What's this? Non. Here's a polar because there's a lone pair. Non. Well, here's a lone pair. Oh, wait, it's charged. Going to be water soluble or not? Joshua, are you nodding yes? Ions, are they, are they water soluble? Yeah, so this is water soluble. You eat mushrooms. You don't smoke them. This is THC. This is the active ingredient in marijuana. You can actually do a vaporization process, a fractional distillation. The other component is called CBD. One of them gives the hallucinogenic effects, and one gives like a relaxing effect. And you can separate them with a vaporizing pipe. Not here in Singapore. <laughs> OK. Um, but this is one of them, polar and nonpolar, CH3, CH3, lots of Cs. Here's an OH, there's like a lone pair, and that is it. It is almost all nonpolar. So this is generally inhaled, uh, also very not good for you. Nicotine also inhaled, polar and nonpolar, lone pairs and lone pairs. But the rest of this is all nonpolar. Uh, consequently, it just ends up getting trapped in your lungs. And yes, it is a poison. It's an insecticide. Tobacco, uh, nicotine is uh, an insecticide. Cocaine is generally smoked um, or uh, what is it called? Snorted when you sniff it up into your mucous membranes, which is filled with lots of water. And look, we've got a lone pair here, nonpolar, 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 nonpolar. Non All of this is nonpolar. All of this is nonpolar, big phenyl group. Lone pairs here, lone pairs here. So there's pockets of polarity and pockets of non-polarity. So again, it might get stuck in your nostrils. And finally, lysergic acid, diethylamid, is known as LSD or acid. All non-polar. Here's a lone pair. Here's a lone pair. Non, all of this is all non-polar. Oh, lone pair here. So the structural, uh, and you're not ever expected to know how to draw these Lewis structures, but you are expected to know how to analyze them. If I give you a molecule and say, is this, fat, is this likely to be fat soluble or water soluble? The easy one would be something where it's quite simple, like retinol, vitamin A. Huge amounts of nonpolar, only a little tiny bit. Don't get swayed by, oh, there's hydrogen bonding ability. It's just one little part of the whole molecule. And this isn't drawn to scale. OK, uh, the last little thing is about temperature and solubility. Uh, you guys already know that if you heat something up, somebody, you said stirring, and if you heat up a, a solution, a mixture of, let's say, table salt or sugar and water, it dissolves better. Solubility is de defined as grams of solute per 100 grams of water. So let's just look at KNO3, this line. This is an equilibrium line. This is the how soluble it is, how, how well it goes into solution at different temperatures. The overall trend is positive. You heat it up, they dissolve better. Yes, there's a couple of exceptions, but for the most of the solids, you heat it up, it dissolves better. And you already know that with sugar and, and salt. But gases are the opposite, and you already know that. When you leave a Coke out, what happens? A Coca-Cola opened outside. What happens? It goes flat. What does go flat mean? 
the gas escapes, leaves the solution, becomes less soluble. Any one of those explanations are fine. Don't, don't just give that ghost flat. Give the rest of the explanation. Let's pretend that says carbon dioxide, which is what's the gas in soda water. Uh, refrigerator temperature is like 4 or 5 degrees. Let's just say 5. So at 5 degrees, it's pretty soluble. And then we go over here to room temperature. Solubility has dropped way off. So when you pick up a Coke that's at room temperature, a lot of the bubbles, a lot of the CO2 is gone. So you already know about that one as well. Um, Henry's Law, it's kind of iffy on whether it will be on the AP. I, I looked through the book this morning. It's The pressure is proportional to the concentration with a constant in there. So let me show you instead of giving you the math, because that would definitely be gone. The picture is better. This is what you would be asked to discuss. Remember, they're all about particle diagrams now. This could be a good, even multiple choice question. So you have some solvent, and you have a gaseous compound, uh, you know, something above it. If you press down on it, the particles go into the solution. So what happens to the concentration of this? More it's more concentrated. There's the algebraic way, which is gone from the AP. Here's the particle diagram way, which is what they love right now. So this is what you'd be asked to explain. Oh, it's right here still, sorry. So when you increase the pressure above a solvent and solute, you're essentially pushing the molecules down into water, into the solvent, and so it becomes more concentrated. Uh, equilibrium, we have a whole chapter on that, so I'm going to skip that, but those lines are equilibrium lines. But there's a couple of words you have to know, which is unsaturated, saturated, and supersaturated. So unsaturated means that the solution has the ability to hold more particles. That's when you're over here, because this is the saturation equilibrium line. So let's say you heated something up to 70 degrees, KNO3. You have to go all the way up to this line, which is about 135 grams of KNO3 per 100 mils of water. And then you'll see crystals falling to the bottom. OK, let's do that again. You just have a clear colorless solution of potassium nitrate, and it's at 25 degrees. And it's, there's no particles, so no crystals on the bottom. Or maybe it is saturated. Maybe you're here. And then you warm it up to 65 or 70, and it can hold a lot more solute. So we call that unsaturated. If it's unsaturated, you cannot see crystals on the bottom. You could stir more in. But when it's super saturated, you see crystals on the bottom. You've saturated the solution with all the solvent that it can hold, and so they just go straight down to the bottom of the container. And let's pause there.